Well, this is one of my favourite places at Newborough on the northeast Scotland coast. And uh, we'll just pan around here. And you can see on the far shore, there's all the seals. But today we want to talk about passive margins. They're not very interesting. Just a lot of thermal subsidence and infill. Or are they? So today we're going to take a look at the Lisbon earthquake. A game changer. In uh, 1755, there was a major earthquake in Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, and uh, it catalyzed a lot of change in history. So here we are located on the Atlantic coast of Portugal, and highlighted there is the, uh, the city of Lisbon. And today's video draws heavily on two great sources of information. One of them is a uh, publication here, Elsevier's uh, Quaternary International, and uh, you can see the title of the paper, quite long-winded. And then there's another one here, which was a paper by Max Gertz and uh, Matt Simmons, which is the Great Lisbon Earthquake of 1755. The links are down there, and we'll put them down below. But this was inspired by um, a nice little short video, which I would recommend. It's about seven minutes long, a little mini-drama that the BBC have put out on their website. And again, we'll put the link down to that uh, if anybody's interested. So... The claim, uh, you know, made in the BBC is that it was the, sort of the birth of modern seismology. It was start of a sort of modern scientific reasoning and, and sort of marked the start of the Age of Enlightenment, which is in turn said to have accelerated very significant political events, uh, such as the French Revolution and the abolition of slavery. I think it goes on uh, to make more claims, which uh, might be a little bit over the top, but anyway, artistic license. But really, why we're looking at it is because, um, well, Portugal is uh, situated on the eastern side of the Atlantic Ocean on a, a passive margin in plate tectonic settings. And with passive margins, you know, I'd typically be thinking of it's quiet, kind of boring, you know, sort of um, uniformitarianism principles applying, nothing exciting happens. And, you know, that's the image that I might have. But... You know, a passive margin is the transition between the oceanic and continental lithosphere that is not an active plate margin. So in the diagrams on the left here, you can see the upwelling at, at the mid-Atlantic ridges, the thinning of the crust, the uh, thermal uplift, and then the spreading of the basaltic oceanic crust as it moves away. And the mechanisms are probably to do with the convective cells and the sinking of the crust as it, as it cools. So um, all that good stuff. So how they differ to active margins? Well, you know, in the active margins, which are shown here on the left, and this, this example here from South America, you can see the oceanic crust coming along in the Pacific and starting to, to be subducted, to go back into the Earth's mantle. And as a result of that, typically we would find a, a trench, and then we would also find that we, we would get all this volcanism. And the Andes are an example of this. Whereas the passive margin, basically a relatively quiescent tectonic activity in that region. So just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, well... On the 1st of November 1755, at 10.24am, nobody expects, no, no, not that, nobody expects an 8.7 magnitude earthquake and an unusually long duration, six to seven minutes of shaking. Now, what happened next was not just the earthquake, there was a tsunami and then there was a citywide fire. It's estimated that somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 people were killed and that 85% of the buildings in Lisbon were either destroyed or heavily damaged. Now, this doesn't sound like the sort of thing you'd expect on a passive margin. So, it was called the start of the Age of Enlightenment, the birth date of seismology. And how do we know all this, and how do we know so much about it? Well, there were no seismometers, and it was definitely before the IGY, the International Geophysics Year, which actually wasn't a year, it was more like 18 months, but never mind. It's probably as much down to uh, this gentleman here, the, the Marquis of Pombal, and he was the Prime Minister of, uh, of Portugal. And, uh, and that's his name, but I'm not going to try and butcher that. 
But the Marquis, he basically started to gather information from all around Portugal and beyond to understand what the amount of damage was and used eyewitness reports. It's all captured in this fantastic paper, which I've already mentioned, but it's worth a read. And some of the following pictures come from that. So you can see the actual epicenter of the quake or as we'll go on to discuss, probably several epicenters, uh, was offshore and probably southwest of Lisbon. And you can see these zones of varying degrees of effects and activities. And, and in fact, historical records show that there were unusual wave activity as far away as uh, Santiago de Cuba and here, uh, you know, across uh, Latin America and even up to North America. A lot of places right up here, as far as Iceland, you know, this, this was a big, big earthquake and it had an effect over a huge region. Now, there's a great collation of quality data, as you would find in, the, in our Trove databases. And you can see that uh, they've mapped out the sort of the intensity of the damage across various zones. Another map here. Here's uh, some photographs uh, actually showing uh, some rock falls and uh, some detached tombs that, uh, you know, that quite a lot of activity going on in here. And uh, th this was the zone here where it was affected, also across into the northwest coast of, of Africa there. So quiet, geologically uniform materialism, um, not, not quite what we're describing here with something quite this large. Well, what was it all about? Well, the authors of these papers go on to describe it in a lot of technical detail, you know, where this thing, and, and it looks like there was maybe several areas where there was a series of earthquakes, one probably triggering, triggering the other, triggering the next, and a whole sequence perhaps as a tear would rip. This was, a, I think, a really nice illustration. This comes from that BBC uh, video. So you can see here the uh, seismic activity associated with the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. But this here is this uh, Azores transfer zone. And you can see a lot of activity on that. And it kind of gets into the region of where the, uh, the Lisbon earthquake uh, took place. But then it actually seems to tie in with this zone of intense tectonic activity activity here on the northern part of the the atlas mountains and and making its way here all the way across uh, to the eastern mediterranean so it's quite an extensive system so uh, although it's a passive margin some of these uh, transfer faults are, are obviously very very active and, and can tie in with uh, uh, other major tectonic zones so the source well it's discussed in these papers and three areas are proposed for it I think each one of these, uh, kind of concluding, uh, insufficient to account for all the damage and, and the magnitude of the earthquake. So, you know, possibly some combination of a subduction beneath the Gulf of Cadiz, um, that transform fault that we saw, the Azores-Gibraltar transform, and then basically, uh, you know, kind of all of the above. It's important to remember that for the Lisbon earthquake, the only available data are the intensities derived from documented damages, and consequently, all other derived physical parameters are only estimates. But, I mean, a great piece of work collating all this information so that one day scientists can, can actually have a look at it. Now, key takeaways. Um, it's described as a rare and singular global scale event. Well... You know, we've only actually been studying geology for um, around about 200 years since, uh, you know, James Hutton came up with some of those uh, initial ideas. Or put into perspective, you know, that's the percentage of the planet's history. That's the time that we've actually been, uh, been studying geology. And it may well be that the passive margins, you know, over a significant amounts of time may not be all that passive. So if we look, this is from uh, Wikipedia, and this is looking back at the 1969 Portugal earthquake. And you can see that uh, in this account here, it, it was only a 7.8 and only 13 deaths. But, um, you know, the effects were shaking, fissures, liquefaction, tsunamis, waves, hydrological and hydrogeological effects. And in this picture here, you know, you're seeing the combination of the, the tsunami and the subsequent fires. I think the fires down to the fact that people ran out of their houses to get away from them and they left candles burning and those candles would end up setting fire to places, etc. But, you know, if we look back, uh, you can see it's not just the 1755 nor the 1969 
But we have other earthquakes in uh, 1531. Lisbon was destroyed in the 17th century. There's uh, seven quakes recorded and so on and so forth back through time. And certainly there's more missing from the list. And of course, you know, looking forward, when is the next one going to happen? Well, why is it important to us? The study of Lisbon really led to modern day seismology and to seismic. And here on the, on the right, you're seeing that you know, the sort of scientists and engineers together have, have gone out and, and now we can acquire really um, quite detailed images of the Earth's crust by actually um, acquiring uh, seismic sampling. It's one of the, uh, the key tools used to understand the subsurface and it's a key for not just the exploration of hydrocarbons but for, for other mineral resources as well. As to uh, how seismic works, well, that's probably for a, another video. Thanks very much for watching. Please like, subscribe and ring that bell. Look forward to having you back on our channel soon. Bye for now.